Um, Marshall Chin, uh, who will be moderating and speaking in the next session, is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics uh, and, the, and Associate Director at the McLean Center. Marshall is a general internist with extensive experience caring for vulnerable patients, uh, patients with chronic disease, and a national expert on health disparities in medicine. Uh, Marshall went to medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, and did his residency fellowship and public health master's degree at Harvard. He, he is the associate chief and the director of research for the section of general internal medicine here at the university, as well as the director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research. Last month, just last month, it was announced that Marshall was one of 60 physicians throughout the nation who were elected this year to the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. Today, uh, as I say, uh, Dr. Chin will moderate the next panel and will also give a talk entitled Movement Advocacy, Personal, Movement Advocacy, Personal Relationships, and Ending Healthcare Disparities. But let's just welcome Marshall again. Thanks, Mark, for the, the kind introduction. So this summer, I spent two and a half months in New Zealand. And summer in Chicago is winter in New Zealand, at the New Zealand Southern Hemisphere. And so my wife, Naoko, and Toshi, a son, they came up for two and a half weeks. Then we did a little bit of traveling, which included uh, skiing in the summer. This is Queenstown area in New Zealand. It's a beautiful country. And uh, about two years ago, we spent some of our, our winter holiday here in the States in uh, Michigan, also skiing. Uh, not, not quite the same view, but uh, still uh, wonderful to, to do the skiing. And you know how it is during a family vacation where you're not supposed to work. Uh, I actually found that there were, there were a couple issues that were really sort of uh, gnawing at me. And so I found that like uh, late at night after the family went to bed, I would start going to the laptop and, and writing. And I would get up early in the morning and write also. And, and what it was was uh, uh, right around that time, a couple years ago, this was the height of the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 movement. As well as here in Chicago, there was a Laquan McDonald shooting. Um, nationally, this got news also, the, the terrible uh, video of uh, uh, a young black man being shot uh, uh, in cold blood by the police. And then here, close to home, uh, this was when they were, again, it was the height of like, the protests regarding the lack of a trauma center here in Chicago. And I don't even know if you remember, I think it was like one of the weekly conferences, I don't think it was the, the annual conference, but uh, I remember vividly Mark was introducing a speaker, I think it was for the weekly conference, where uh, the local protesters came and um, interrupted for about 30 seconds and, and then left. Um, but it was it impacted the, the McLean Center also. And the thing that, 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 that uh, in a sense troubled me in a sense is that like, um, um, I tend to be sort of an in the system person, that sort of marching the streets isn't my natural sort of comfort zone. Uh, and yet, there were these huge issues in terms of, of police brutality, in terms of a lack of a trauma center on the south side. And therefore, I was at the computer screen during the vacation in, in Michigan writing. And uh, for this particular talk, I'm going to basically share that paper with you, that uh, the three goals are to describe health as a human justice issue and the role of movement advocacy. Second, to outline the roles of interpersonal relationships and trust in achieving health equity. And third, and really this is this core, is to discuss the tension between advocacy and building trusting personal relationships for achieving health equity. And really asking, is it possible to reconcile the two? And I have to say, this is, I've written a lot of papers in my career, and this is the paper where I've asked for the most feedback. Uh, I got personal feedback from these 16 or so different folks, including, I guess by chance, or maybe not by chance, um, all the speakers in this morning's panel. And so the paper, <laughs> the paper is uh, much better because of their input. Uh, and uh, a word for the trainees here and fellows that um, uh, the past two years were a good paper writing uh, period for me. Uh, and I think that of um, all the papers in the past two years, this paper is probably one of the two or three most thoughtful ones I've written. It's also a paper that was rejected six times. So it, it took a journal number seven. 
Um, so don't give up in terms of like submitting. Um, and also, uh, don't like just stew on it. So that I would actually turn around re rejection within one or two days. So that I think from the time of initial submission to acceptance, it was about eight months. So pretty fast. So uh, one of our colleagues in France, Monica Vella, who uh, some of you know, uh, she's uh, a general internist here at UC. In the past dozen years, she's led a required health disparities course for the incoming first year students. She told me a story maybe six, seven, eight years ago where uh, some of the students came up to her and said, um, Dr. Vella, but we so appreciate that you're, you're, you're giving this course, but, but, but to be honest, we don't need it. That uh, we're the post-racial generation, that uh, we're, we're colorblind. Uh, we realized you and older folks like you, uh, it's a different era and um, there were these issues, but well, not for us. Well, it was Harold Pollack who's going to speak a little bit later who, who, who uh, taught me that like, uh, uh, technology can be a disruptive uh, influence. And so we have the ubiquitous cell phone with camera, and we have now like the, the, the dash cams on the police uh, uh, cruisers. And so we saw then in, in the uh, recent years then uh, vivid video showing that unfortunately we, we aren't in a post-racial society. And in some ways um, our, our young students six or seven, eight years ago were perhaps overly optimistic. It's a famous quote from Martin Luther King that uh, some of you have heard of, of, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. It turns out it's not inhumane, which many people think, but it, the, the inverse of the quote is inhuman. And if you think about like the civil rights movement and then also then like police brutality now in terms of uh, against racial ethnic minorities, in some ways it's a good test case for the question of well, when is movement advocacy necessary? And I would argue that there are three main uh, criteria where, uh, when it reaches this point, then this type of advocacy is necessary. When the injustice is great, so again, think civil rights movement or, uh, or police brutality. Um, when the power differential between oppressor and oppressed is large, and where the willingness of the powerful to reform the system is low. So you may ask, well, for health disparities, uh, do these criteria apply? Well, I mean, as, as bad as police brutality is, there's far many more people that die or are harmed by health disparities. And so the injustice is, is great. Um, the others, well, you know, we do have a lot of mountains to climb to achieve health equity. I just put down a, a few here in terms of, well, you know, are we really working on these? So the battle over expanding health insurance has been really tough. Um, do we truly tailor care to different populations? Some, but not enough. Do we address the social determinants of health? Hardly at all. Uh, and are we, what are we doing to reform the payment system of health care so health equity is sustainable? Uh, essentially nothing. Uh, so uh, we do have sort of a, a, a long way to go in terms of um, um, people really caring about the issue and then uh, this power differential. And there are important policy levers, both uh, governmental in terms of regulation and then the free market in terms of then the policy levers of the free market. So really there was advocacy involved in terms of both levels. So also around this time, I wrote this sort of bizarrely titled blog piece, uh, Moonshots, Opioids, and Incentives, which was accompanied by this picture, actually. Uh, and I, when I, I got down to it, I actually concluded that, um, so why do health disparities persist? A simple answer is that our country tolerates them. So early in the presidential campaign, uh, some people may remember this, that uh, there was a Black Lives um, protest where I think it was Bernie Sanders and then it was the, uh, I think it was Maryland's uh, governor who was running for office where they, it, they uh, interrupted the campaign event and they actually, Bernie Sanders and that, that governor could not speak. And so before one of uh, Senator Clinton's um, um, events, um, she actually approached the protesters and said, look, don't interrupt me now, I'm going to be happy to speak to you after uh, my talk. And so if you Google the video, it's really quite amazing that um, it's this video, and that's actually a point of campaign where people were criticizing um, uh, Clinton for being too passive. So the video is maybe like four or five minutes where she's just listening uh, to the man on the right uh, uh, talk about the issues of the Black Lives Matter. And then she really sort of lays into it. And I'll share two quotes from you. For you. So uh, Senator Clinton, you can get lip service from as many white people you can pack into Yankee Stadium and a million more like it who are going to say, we get it, we get it, we're going to be nicer. That is not enough, at least in my book, says Senator Clinton. She goes on to say, look, I don't believe you changed hearts. I believe you changed laws, you changed allocation of resources, you changed the way systems operate. You're not going to change every heart, you're not. But at the end of the day, we could do a whole lot to change some hearts and change some systems and create more opportunities for people who deserve to have them. 
So Senator Clinton was appealing to the issue about changing systems, and systems are powerful. And actually, another thing she says, she, she really does talk about changing the heart also, that this idea about appealing to the best in everyone, everyone's intrinsic motivation in a sense, both being very important. And another example right around this time was uh, Missouri, so you may remember this story. Uh, so it's an example of advocacy for increasing understanding and motivation. So on the University of Missouri campus, there were a number of, of uh, racial and anti-LGBT incidents, these bigotry incidents. And then the uh, University of Missouri School of Michigan was quite slow in terms of the response. And um, so you, you remember the national story was then the, the football team, it was before one of the big games, was, was probably going to bring in a lot of money to the university. They basically protested and said, we're not going to play uh, unless you address this in, in, in more detail. And it was amazingly fast. I think it was like literally one or two days, and then the, the president of the university resigned. So an example of advocacy to increase understanding, to increase motivation for change. And uh, back to Martin Luther King, a letter from the Birmingham jail, very famous. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there's a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. This is issue then of, well, reconciling advocacy then with the interpersonal relationships and trust, which I believe are necessary to achieve health equity. Some of it's internal, so in terms of self-awareness and commitment. So clinicians understanding their subconscious biases and shared decision making with patients, or administrators recognizing that how their clinic delivers care may be systematically set up in a way that leads to these disparities and worse outcomes. So in some ways, to have that type of self-awareness, it does require a trusting environment. Uh, at the University of Chicago, we're like years, in year four of the uh, equity initiative. James Williams was uh, part of the leaders here, is here in the part of the initiative. One of the first things we did as, as an initiative was we actually had the people who were going to be leading the initiative have a two-day retreat, basically to work through our own personal baggage regarding um, um, equity and biases and whatnot. Uh, it's thought to be such a fundamental part of it. There's also this issue that like, when you do reforms or quality improvement or uh, changes, when you're trying to have an equity lens, the same thing, that to address these fundamental issues, it requires then a certain amount of trust uh, and a certain amount of developing good relations with the people that you work with. I mean, if someone says to us, well, you know, you're a racist now, Marshall, uh, um, let's work together to uh, uh, work on improving equity. Well, it's a difficult environment in terms of um, that type of, of, of context. So again, there's this tension between having a safe, non-threatening learning environment and discomfort to convince some of the need for change. So the woman on the far right, her name is uh, Jennifer Smith, who's a, a physician, uh, used to be at Cook County Hospital, recently retired, a general internist, a uh, wonderful person. Uh, she also is a palliative care physician and a geriatrician by background. And so I took this like a workshop, like this breakfast workshop that she was leading on conflict or conflict resolution. And I thought she had some really wise things to say, and I want to share this quote from you. Um, she said that, uh, so Dr. Jennifer Smith uh, explained that a conflict is a personal narrative with a beginning, middle, and end. At the beginning, parties frequently experience powerful emotions such as anger, frustration, fear, and surprise, and often make assumptions based on their values and biases. The middle phase encompasses listening and telling, adjusting facts, and clarifying options. In the end, one can hope for agreement, compromise, and reconciliation but at a minimum, it should be possible to envision a new future with common facts, decreased emotion, and more clarity moving forward. So you can think about her context that uh, as a physician at Cook County, working on end-of-life care decisions with a very diverse population, you can imagine that there being a, a lot of tough issues that come out, a lot of conflict. Uh, and I thought it was actually a very nice analogy for what we're talking about now. And so some may say to you, well, you know, Marshall or Dr. Smith, are you being Pollyannish here? That thing about like our current sort of uh, national environment where it's, it is so um, uh, uh, partisan right now, and um, some of our national leaders have had quite divisive rhetoric, and clearly that has not helped. But, but I do think that when you break it down to an individual level, so when you talk to individuals or you bring in individuals uh, who you may have a conflict with and learn their stories, their experiences, then my experience has been that then that, that's what works in terms of when people have to, um, if you make progress, people need to understand and identify with um, the issues of the other person in their particular shoes. And so I do think that what Dr. Smith says here is reasonable and, and possible in terms of 
Uh, you're not going to solve the world in one uh, swoop or potentially have a lot of agreement initially, but uh, that issue of understanding the other's uh, perspective. And so a lot of my talks, I actually talk about uh, when it comes down to like, addressing equity, it requires then honest discussions about racism, colonialism, equity. So, <laughs> caveat here. So, um, after this uh, workshop, then I you know, revised my paper. I was all happy about it. And uh, I had in this line about, well, then, you know, one of the keys is dialogue. And then, um, this is actually Monica Peake's feedback. It's one of the most important feedback she gave me on the paper. She goes, well, Marshall, he's still being a little bit naive here that um, um, you're forgetting the power differential. So, yeah, think about the University of Missouri example. So, if I said, well, you know, it, you know, racially ethnic minority students, you just need to basically sort of, you know, sit down with the administration and have an honest discussion and all. And Monica's point was that um, there's a power differential between disparity populations and establishment which make it difficult. Uh, so in terms of like, if you think about them as potentially equal partners and then therefore the expectation, especially from the, the marginalized population of having an equal uh, t the seat at the table. So it's issue like if you're a marginalized population, you're also battling the weight of the status quo or the administration that has like all the power. And her point being that uh, there also needs to be acknowledgement and appreciation of the difference in lived experiences of the different parties and encouragement of people to tell their stories. And also there's this point about the importance of strong community relationships because they will be inevitably, and I think we find here in the University of Chicago, something like working on the, the trauma center or disparities in general on the south side, they will be inevitably difficult conversations and storms that will require um, this type of honest dialogue within this context. So this is an iconic picture, a Japanese picture. So in the 60s in Japan, like in many other countries, there were a variety of different protests uh, against the establishment. So this is a very famous iconic picture. There's also a lot embedded in this image. So I ended the, the paper by saying, well, I believe that movement advocacy can break down ingrained structural barriers and policies that impede health equity, while clinicians, healthcare organizations, and advocates build trusting relationships and resolve conflict with mutual respect and honesty. We must combine advocacy and relationship building to end disparities. Achieving health equity will require policy changes and personalized critical care in organizational transformation that are dependent upon goodwill and trust. So I'm going to end with a story about Paul Farmer. And so this is a, a picture from Paul, and, and this is Jim Kim, who uh, is the co-founder of Partners of Health, and both are amazing people. Uh, Jim is currently the president of the World Bank. Um, but they did their residency, uh, they're both medical students at, at Harvard, and they did their residency at the Brigham Women's Hospital. And so um, uh, my senior year, my third year residency year, during my MICU intensive care rotation, uh, Paul happened to be my intern. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there are all these stories, like so the house staff allows, so I so, said, Marshall, what did you do today? Uh, well, I was so happy, I was able to get the IV into this patient that was a difficult stick. So Paul, what did you do today? Oh, my hospital in Haiti saved a thousand people's lives. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so, so what about Paul is that he, he's an amazing clinician, so that um, I remember there was this one patient, it was an older white woman who was quite sick, and she was depressed, and she wanted to die. She wanted to, she wanted to die. Um, and Paul was so patient with her that uh, um, he's one of the few clinicians that has that, um, he can get away with calling a patient by their first name. So every day he would spend so much time with her, term, sit on the bed, talk with her, and basically, a lot of it's non-medical, it was basically sort of encouraging her and, and basically helping her to, to move on. So when I rotated off the rotation, she was still in the hospital, and I later found out she ended up pulling through, and later when she was able to speak um, more thoroughly, she credited Paul for uh, more that sort of emotional support in terms of really being, it was so much the, the classic McLean Center uh, physician. Um, so, you know, the classic physician here. Um, my last month of residency, or it was the beginning of my fellowship when I was still in Boston, um, I heard Paul give a talk, which will probably reasonably similar to the talk we'll hear this afternoon. Uh, and it's the first time I actually heard Paul speak in terms of the public health hat. And it's a different Paul Farmer. Um, I actually had a hard time finding the right picture for this, that you look on the web uh, for Paul's pictures, and most of them he's smiling. But it was a different emotion that he was projecting in this particular talk. And the emotion he was projecting was anger. It was a really angry Paul Farmer. I'd never seen him that way before. And uh, this is one of the quotes from one of his books that I think captured why he was angry. Uh, Structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people. So as I've reflected on it over the years, in some ways I think Paul is able to reconcile these tensions I've talked about, that 
that he's an amazing individual, um, and my guess is in his talk, he'll also, he'll also come across in terms of his, his, him as a compassionate, uh, kind physician. But he speaks out about injustice and these huge factors that do need efficacy. So I think it is possible to combine both in, in, in our, our lives. And so I'll end by saying that leadership matters. And it's not just the Paul Farmers of the world that, um, you know, Paul, you know, he's amazing. Uh, but, you know, all of us, uh, I'm increasingly convinced that all of us have a really important role in terms of addressing equity. So our professional responsibility as clinicians, administrators, and policymakers to improve the way we deliver care to diverse patients. We can do better. Thank you very much. Deborah. Hi there. Um, thank you. That was lovely. Um, I guess I feel compelled to speak out among, uh, for the people that I work with who I think are completely unrepresented, and that would be people with chronic psychiatric illnesses. Um, they meet all the criteria that you list. They are disenfranchised. The injustice is enormous. We have plenty of data going back 50 years showing that white people and black people who present with the same symptoms are diagnosed differently and that black people are put on medications that serve to quiet them so that they can't articulate the real trauma they've experienced while white people are treated very differently and ferreted toward psychotherapy where they can express the trauma they've experienced. And I think there is nobody who is effectively representing these people. The city of Chicago a number of years ago closed half the mental health centers. The University of Chicago made a decision which it consistently reaffirms that psychiatric patients have no place in our hospital. And who will represent these patients? I am struggling with that. And I applaud your optimism, but I'm struggling to join you in that optimism. And I wonder what thoughts you might have. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. And I'm, I'm looking, look forward to you. I, I, I think I've encouraged you over time, too, that, to, to do more speaking and writing about this. Uh, I think a first step is like more stories, that we need to have more uh, patient stories about uh, how this plays out in terms of individuals' lives. And I think that type of combination with um, the detailed knowledge of people like you who understand the system factors then that are driving this, that combination of the two, the individual stories plus the knowledge of how the systems can be changed. Uh, some ways it gets back to that Clinton quote about like um, hearts and, and minds and systems. You know, that'd be a great first step. But thank you for the comment. You're, you're right on target. Um, so we're going to move on to, oh, one more, um, one more. <laughs> if you can uh, say name and where you're from, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful question. Um, I'm going to refer you to a paper we have in the Journal of General Internal Medicine this year on, uh, we call it like high stakes for LGBTQ people of color. It sort of grapples with this issue of like uh, advocacy. And just in brief, what I would say is that um, there's no right one answer that um, people have to figure out where along the spectrum advocacy is the right place for you. I think all of us would agree that we need to advocate for individual patients. 
Some people may feel comfortable like, marching in the streets. Some people may feel comfortable working with organizations. And so there's like three or four different domains you can think about in terms of patient care, in terms of uh, teaching and mentoring roles for others, in terms of outright of health policy, and then sort of systems change within your organization. All of them are very legitimate ways to, to advocate. And again, I think the right answer is, is that it depends upon you as, as a person, individual. I would encourage people, though, to um, not be afraid and to develop skills in each of these different areas. Uh, because um, a lot of times people don't feel comfortable because they don't definitely have done this before. Uh, so I think like partnering with people that, that have experience and over time developing your skill set. And there, and also too, you have different roles in terms of your work role as, your, as well as your role as a citizen. And so different hats will also mean uh, different times, uh, uh, different opportunities. But check out that article. Thank you very much. And so our second speaker is Albert Huang, who is a professor of medicine uh, here at the University of Chicago, a general internist. And he's a, a, one of the, I think, uh, most thoughtful people here at the University of Chicago. And he, has, he again, it's like a Paul Farmer, he has the ability to sort of integrate sort of um, understanding of individuals and people with macro health policy. Um, he is an uh, international leader in terms of geriatric diabetes policy, uh, cost policy analyses for diabetes, and spent a year uh, in um, the Obama administration uh, after the Affordable Care Act. Uh, he was one of the people that wrote the regulations for implementing the Affordable Care Act. So, Albert, uh, geographic disparities in diabetes and obesity and the long arc of health policy.